Okay, uh, we'll have a start. Welcome everyone to this LSE festival event on uh, whether octopuses have feelings. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Roberts. I'm an associate professor here at the LSE of uh, philosophy, logic, and scientific method. And uh, like many of you, I love cute octopus videos. And I think really viral internet videos have been a big part of how we all came to understand a bit more about what octopuses and crabs and lobsters are like. Octopuses are particularly remarkable that they're so smart. Uh, many videos of them hurling rocks at windows, but also people making friends with them. Viral internet video recently of a woman making close friends with an octopus that she would revisit regularly in the sea. Uh, but whereas with many animals that we make friends with, like cats and dogs, we have this special concern for when they're treated badly, we would even report someone to the authorities for treating our cat or dog badly. It's much more recent that we've started to think about octopuses and crabs and lobsters in that way. Well, in the UK, uh, a recent law asks policymakers to take into consideration whether or not an animal is conscious when deciding how it should be treated, or in particular, whether or not it's sentient. But that demands, of course, many questions for both philosophers and scientists. What does sentience mean? What is its implications for the law? What is its implications for how we treat uh, living things around us? So I'm very pleased to have with us here today uh, three experts on this topic. Uh, all the way uh, on your right is Dr. Jonathan Birch. He's an associate professor of philosophy at the LSE. He's principal investigator of the Animal Sentience Project and lead author on a recent review of the evidence of sentience in cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans that led to a new UK animal welfare law. Uh, let's see, here uh, on my left is Dr. Hugh Gollidge. He holds a PhD in neuroscience and is chief executive office and scientific director of the Humane Slaughter Association and of the University's Federation of Animal Welfare. And in the middle is Dr. Penny Hawkins. Uh, she holds a PhD in physiology and has worked for 25 years at the RSPCA, that's the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, uh, where she's head of the Animals in Science Department. Uh, we're about to have about a 45 minute discussion. It'll just be a panel discussion. We'll have a chat together, followed by 15 minutes of questions. So if you could just keep your questions in mind till the end, uh, there will be a roving mic going around then. This event is being recorded for video and for podcasts, just so that you're aware. If you do speak, uh, you will be recorded. Uh, if you could take a moment and please turn off your phones. We'd like to focus on the discussion and not uh, the phone ringing. If you're the type of person who tweets about these things, there's a hashtag that is hashtag LSE Festival. Uh, thanks in particular uh, to all of you for coming, but also to our sponsors, the Forum for Philosophy, as well as the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Methods, and the Center for Philosophy of Natural and Social Sciences all sponsored this event. And I uh, hope you're having a great day at the LSE Festival. Lots of great events happening today, um, but let's launch off with the discussion. So first of all, uh, we're gonna discuss whether or not octopuses have feelings too, whether octopuses are sentient. What does sentient even mean? Uh, Jonathan, could you maybe start us off? What does sentience mean to you? How can I tell, tell it, uh, you know, am I sentient? How can I tell something is sentient? I think you are sentient, yeah. I think, Thank yeah. you. Sentience is a fancy word for the capacity to have feelings. We're all intimately familiar with feelings from our own lives, feelings of pain, pleasure, anxiety, joy, comfort, discomfort, hunger, thirst, warmth. And the question is whether other animals and which other animals are capable of having states like that. It's not just about pain, although pain does have this special ethical significance because it's so terrible when an animal is, is in pain. It's not even just about pain or pleasure. It's about the whole category of feelings, including the positive side of mental life, as well as the negative side. I think it's worth emphasizing that we're looking here for quite a basic capacity, a really elementary, potentially quite evolutionarily ancient capacity. We're not thinking about the ability to understand one's own feelings, which is much more complicated and is something many of us struggle with in our own lives. And it's not the capacity to reflect on one's feelings or understand the feelings of others. These are all more sophisticated things. Sentience is just about the capacity to have feelings. Is there something it feels like to be this animal or not? Well, okay. I'm familiar enough in the case of humans, what it means to have feelings, various implications. If I'm angry, I might shout and so on. Uh, 
how does, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this, Hugh, how does the role of one species uh, matter in determining whether or not you're having a given feeling? That's a very good and very difficult question, I guess. <laughs> um, and it's almost impossible to answer for animals, except by some sort of analogy to humans, because we are the only species that we know are conscious and sentient. Um, so a lot of it is by analogy that um, similar experiences might cause similar feelings in animals that are also sentient. So, um, you know, certainly when we look at mammals, they do, they respond in very similar ways to negative and positive things to, to the way we do. They, they clearly respond to things that we would expect to cause them pain in a way that you'd expect. They try and avoid it and they learn to avoid it and so on. So that kind of analogy takes you so far, but then we get into questions, perhaps one that I'd like to, to ask Jonathan what he thinks about, uh, uh, of whether there are degrees of sentience, whether some animals might be somewhat sentient, but less sentient or differently sentient to, to us, um, or whether there's just a threshold above which everything is sentient. Mm. Do you have a I, thought on that, Jonathan? I don't personally believe in this idea of some animals being more sentient than others or more conscious than others. What I do think you have is a huge amount of variation across the animal kingdom, but that variation does not fall onto a single scale of any kind. What you have is variation along multiple different dimensions, all kinds of ways in which animals can vary in what sorts of feelings they have, in the intensity of those feelings, in the richness, and in everything else, like their sensory abilities and how integrated those feelings are, and whether they remember them, whether they anticipate them, Huge amounts of variation, but you can't squash all that variation into a single scale of more or less sentient. Can you give me an example of what you mean by that? You know, what kind of change in intensity or change in expression of feelings that you see across that would make you say these are different kinds of, of sentience? I think we have to be open to the possibility that our you know, human concepts are not even the right concepts for describing the particular feelings an octopus might have. Now, I, if you think of these human concepts, things like grief, anxiety, things like that. We're often tempted to describe an animal's behavior as being you know, a sign of anxiety or a sign of grief. But it's very, you know, very hard to be sure that you know, what the animal is actually feeling is what we would feel in that situation. So to some extent, I don't think we necessarily know what the categories are for describing the feelings of animals. I think that's some, you know, something we, we learn over time through scientific investigation. How has, uh, now this is uh, maybe for you, Penny, how has our continued learning about the way that animals experience their feelings uh, led to new policy changes, led to new laws? Uh, what is the sort of legal status of these new developments in the science of, of sentience? Well, the most striking um, development uh, happened this year when the Animal Welfare Sentience Bill passed into legislation. So we now have an Animal Welfare Sentience Act. Um, this is particularly important because it requires an animal sentience committee to be set up and this committee will scrutinise government policy, past and present, and the implementation of that policy to determine whether the government has paid all due regard to the welfare of sentient animals. This actually um, came about as a, a kind of a Brexit legacy. Um, it occurred because the European Union Withdrawal Bill in 2017 had a suggested amendment which would have brought across um, an article from the European Union Treaty of Lisbon that required the welfare of sentient animals to be paid due regard in, in policy making. Um, this amendment was voted down by the government because the, the uh, MPs had been told not to accept any amendments to the EU withdrawal bill. However, this was interpreted as MPs voting that animals weren't sentient which wasn't the case, but the public um, outcry that ensued after this led to the Animal Welfare Sentience Act. What's especially important about this is that it includes um, cephalopods, so that's octopuses, uh, squid and cuttlefish, and it also includes decapod crustaceans like crabs, lobsters and shrimp. So these are currently not included in the Animal Welfare Act. That's the act that, that prosecutes you if you're cruel to an animal. So at the moment, if you're cruel to a mammal, you can be prosecuted. You can do whatever you like to a crab or an octopus and you won't be prosecuted. So it's really important to have recognition of the sentience of these animals in law 
Another really important development is that the um, Animal Welfare Sentience Act includes free living wild animals because previously these weren't included in animal welfare legislation either. So this increase in scope is very important. It won't necessarily lead to any direct practical improvements for any of these animals at the moment because it just calls for this committee to be set up and to scrutinise government policy. But certainly from an RSPCA perspective, we think it's a really important step towards gaining better recognition for these animals. And of course, it can influence public behaviour. You, know, you don't have to wait for legislation that will prosecute you if you're cruel to a crab. You can just take on board that crabs can suffer. And if you uh, go to a restaurant, if you eat crab, ask if the crab's been stunned or humanely killed before, before boiling. If not, then you don't have to buy it. So there's all sorts of behavioural changes that people can make in response to this legislation. Penny, can I ask if you're happy with the, uh, the legislation? Are there things about it you would have changed? With the Animal Sentience yeah, Act? Yeah, the new act. It would have been nice to see uh, it have greater teeth because at the moment this committee just scrutinises policy and its implementation. It produces an opinion. The Secretary of State has um, a, a fixed time period in which to respond. But in theory, if the Animal Sentience Committee determines that the government didn't pay due regard to the welfare of sentient animals, there's not actually anything that can be done to force the government to change policy or its implementation. So that's a frustration. However, having been involved in the sort of backroom campaigning and, and submission of evidence to try to get this bill and this act through, there's always a tension between bringing in new animal welfare legislation you know, between the uh, animal welfare NGOs who want the legislation and uh, industry and other interests who do not want to be further regulated or have to invest in, in um, changes to practice that would involve paying better regard to animal welfare. So I think it was probably about as good as we were going to get, but it's a, yeah, it's a first step rather than a, than a complete solution. Now, Jonathan, uh, your reports on the evidence for sentience uh, played some role in the development of this legislation and the consultation. Uh, would you like to comment on uh, the con So this was about uh, cephalopod mollusks mm. and decapod, uh, decapods. Would you like to comment on yeah, this? Yeah, basically octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, crabs, lobsters, shrimps. Yeah, the government was in the process of forming this animal welfare sentience bill to create this duty on policymakers in the UK to pay all due regard for animals as sentient beings. One of the problems they quickly ran into is this term animal and exactly which animals. Now, are you gonna include all animals, including microscopic ones like the dust mites in people's bed sheets? Or are you going to try and be precise and specify which animals this act is going to apply to? And I think they sensibly took the second route of actually trying to specify which animals. But then they ran into this problem of should it only be vertebrates? animals with a backbone, or should there also be some invertebrates? And I think the, the widespread awareness of the remarkable intelligence, cognitive abilities of octopuses is such now that they really had to take that issue seriously and think about whether the act was going to apply to some invertebrates as well. So they commissioned my team to produce a report of the evidence of sentience in two particular invertebrate groups, octopuses, cephalopod mollusks, but also some crustaceans like crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. And so we reviewed over 300 scientific studies. We found really quite a lot of evidence that was relevant to questions of sentience. And we ended up recommending that the, the new bill should ideally include both of these groups. Uh, and I suppose hearteningly, the government then did take, take account of our central recommendation and did amend its bill so that, that there now is a duty on policymakers in the UK to consider the interests of octopuses, crabs, and lobsters when formulating policy. So earlier, we were, I think, in response to my question about what it's like to be an octopus, what, is, what are octopus feelings like? How does one species, you know, determine the way you feel things? Uh, it felt like everyone was telling me, like, oh, you can't really know. You know, they're quite different from us. Don't anthropomorphize. How can you conclude something like this in a report that this is an animal who's feelings you should take into consideration when I have so little access to what those feelings are like. Yeah, I mean, I think our report is quite honest about the level of uncertainty in this area, but also it recommends that sometimes certainty can't be the bar for action. Sometimes you can be uncertain about something 
but the evidence can still be sufficient to require you to act. And I think that's a very important idea in many areas of policy, everything from COVID-19 to climate change. We can't be demanding certainty here, but we should demand evidence. And I think that there is lots of evidence um, based on the sort of experiments Hugh was describing, where people would say, well, what do states like pain do for us? Well, it's not just reflexes. So when you touch a, a hot stove, your hand withdraws, but that's just a reflex. The feeling of pain has no role in producing the withdrawal. But pain does do a lot of, a lot of important stuff for us. It has very important roles in learning and in decision-making. So let's go and look whether these animals are capable of the relevant kinds of learning and decision-making. And so a lot of the evidence we were reviewing of that type was of that type and really does point towards now, the evidence is strongest for octopuses. And they very clearly display sophisticated forms of learning and decision-making that in a human, you'd say they're clearly in pain. But also a surprising amount of evidence exists for crabs and lobsters as well. Hugh, do you have any comments on how one can detect pain in animals like octopuses? Yes, uh, with, with, with difficulty is the, is the short answer. I mean, it's very difficult, you know to detect pain in, in almost any animal actually, um, because we have to be very clear about the difference between pain and nociception. So Jonathan talked about reflexes. Nociception is, is a system that senses something happening to your body, which is likely to damage it and might cause a response like pulling your hand away, but that's just a reflex. It doesn't necessarily involve your brain registering that as a um, an emotion and pain is defined as an emotional state. It's the emotional response, the hurting. Um, and that's harder to access and understand whether an animal's actually in pain because it may be in pain and not, for instance, displaying that reflex withdrawal. But what you, I think what the closest you probably get is, is seeing that animals make sophisticated behavioral changes to avoid ending up in pain again. So they'll learn that something is likely to cause them pain and learn to avoid the place where that might happen, for instance. Or maybe they can learn to go and administer themselves uh, an analgesic pain-killing drug um, if they are in pain. And that suggests that the animal is conscious of being in pain and actively trying to do something about it. And I think if you see behaviours that look like that, Although sometimes you can construct explanations which might not mean that they actually are in pain, it's pretty strong evidence that they probably are. And we should, at that point, take the precautionary principle and say, it's likely that animal's suffering and we should try and prevent that. That's, that's how I look at it. Yeah, and I mean, I can describe some of the experiments. So there was one by, by Robin Crook from um, just over a year ago that was particularly striking because it's based on this setup called a condition place preference setup that is often used to assess pain in, in, in mammals, where you give the animal a choice of three chambers. One of them, it's placed after receiving a noxious stimulus, which was an in injection of um, acetic acid, which octopuses absolutely hate. And then another one where it's given access to a local anesthetic, which it can apply to the, applied to the affected area. And so the octopus is initially preferred one chamber and then you know, once they were injured in that chamber, their preferences reversed and they came to strongly prefer the chamber where they could access the local anesthetic. And that's exactly the sort of pattern of behavior where you'd think in any mammal, if you saw that pattern of behavior, you'd think clearly that stimulus has caused it some pain. It now goes to the local anesthetic because the local anesthetic stops it hurting. And if we're willing to make that sort of inference for for a mammal, there's no principled reason to refuse to make that, that inference for an octopus. Can I just say something about these, um, these experiments, if I can just come in? I think the irony is probably not lost on the audience that in order to prove these animals are capable of suffering, some very unpleasant experiments have to be done to them. And I'm not criticizing the people who do these experiments because they've enabled us to, to um, gain better protection for these animals. But it is very ironic, isn't it? So, okay, we've hurt you, we've frightened you, we've put acid on you, we've deconstructed you, but the good news is now you're sentient. And that unfortunately <laughs> is the only way to achieve this at present. It's, uh, it's extremely ironic. I think the work is incredibly important, as you say. Mm -hmm. I also think you know, people working on 
some of these issues are extremely sensitive to these maxims about refine, reduce, and replace, mm. and you know, using the smallest numbers of animals possible. So often, yeah, I mean, th these experiments do involve applying noxious stimuli to animals, but I think the people who do them are often, you know, they're doing it for the right reasons, and, and because of that, they use, you know, the least intense stimuli they, they, they reasonably can. They absolutely do, yes. And I suppose what's interesting is that those experiments are done for the benefit of animals. The, mm. the reason we know so much about the physiology of pain and behavioural responses to pain is, is because we've spent years doing those kind of experiments on rats and mice to try and understand human pain and treat human pain. Um, and, and we probably know more about um the physiology of rats and mice than we do of any other species on the planet because we've yeah. used them for our own um, gains in terms of medical research so i think there's a really interesting distinction there and that's why it's very easy to conclude that rats and mice and probably by extension mammals experience pain and are sentient and why it's so hard about for octopus and crabs because we've had no reason to do medical experiments on them frankly yeah uh, regarding uh, the precautionary principles, so the the uh, it was brought up now a few times the uh, the idea that you don't have to be certain in order to act uh, if you if it's sort of prudent to be cautious. So it's you know things like uh, it's, there's probably a fire in the building is enough reason to leave. You don't have to overthink whether even or not a small certainty. probability of a fire in the building exactly, <laughs> exactly. enough. Uh, so. Now, and where, now, where do we lie on the scale of certainty in this discussion? When we talk about octopus, octopus feelings, octopus reaction to pain, of course, you indicated we, we can lower our standards from certainty. Yeah. Uh, of course, we don't even have certainty about humans, really, and humans do have different experiences of things like pain. Uh, but we know quite a lot. We feel quite confident about humans. Maybe we feel you know, quite unconfident about some animal that's we have very few experiments on. Where do we stand on the scale from, um, from humans to cats and dogs uh, of, of certainty about the experience of, of pain of things like animals like octopuses? So I think it's not clear to me that the evidence for octopuses is, is ultimately any weaker than it would be for mammals. As Hugh was saying, lots of mammals have never really been studied in relation to pain. The vast majority of work is on uh, rats and mice and we extrapolate from rats and mice and say look the mechanisms here are common to all mammals and with octopuses you know a lot of the experiments that have been done on uh, mice and rats have also been attempted on octopuses like the one I was describing so I think it's not just a, a precautionary principle but also a, a, a consistency principle that gets gets you an argument for protecting octopuses that if we're just going to be consistent say the same standards of evidence we apply to vertebrates we should also apply to invertebrates they're clearly meeting all those all those standards you know all of the criteria we came up with as relevant the octopuses were passing is there any reason uh penny why we we focus in this discussion on cephalopods uh octopuses cuttlefish or are there other animals we should be worried about? I mean, Jonathan was sort of joking earlier when he said, should we be worried about sort of bed bugs? Yeah. But uh, is the scope of this discussion so far too narrow? Should we be expanding it a little bit? Yeah, it's, th this is where I think um, politics and, and public opinion start to come into it hugely. Um, so for example, from a, from a sort of a, a public perspective, obviously the RSPCA speaks to the public a lot. We receive, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, a lot of inquiries from the public, many members of the public, when you talk about animals, they're thinking mainly about their own cats and dogs. So for example, we just did um, a survey of people's attitudes towards animals. 46% of people said they felt it was wrong to harm an animal for any reason whatsoever. 46% of people in this country are not vegetarians or vegans. So they're not that, I think they're what they think of as an animal is a very close, very close knit sphere. I think it's just in their own emotional sphere. I think they're largely thinking um, about their pets. And so when we start to um, apply the evidence framework in the report led by, led by Jonathan, when we start to apply all of those criteria, like having you know, nerves that detect damage, um, centers of nervous, nervous tissue that can uh, integrate these responses, connections between the two and all the sort of um, behavioral and learning aspects. When you look at this, clearly mammals, 
tick all the boxes, all animals with backbones tick all the boxes. Now it's been determined that cephalopods and decapod crustaceans tick the boxes, but actually insects do tick a lot of those boxes. Um, much of the scientific literature that's looked at sentience in insect has tended to look at cognition, sort of brain processing um, and learning. There's been less done looking at pain perception, but they do, they do show signs of pain perception, even tool use and cooperative behavior in some insects. And so certainly um, there's scope to apply the precautionary principle to insects too. The RSPCA does. Um, our official policy says that at least some invertebrates are sentient. Uh, we don't actually state which, and I think in the, in the next iteration of our policy document, we will have to be more explicit. But the problem is from a public perspective point of view, if you start to move too quickly with respect to ascribing sentience to, to other invertebrates, then you're likely to lose people. And this is something that we always have to do as, as an animal welfare NGO, and you do too, don't you, who is another animal welfare NGO, you have to sort of pull and cajole people in the right direction, but not, not pull so far that you'll, um, you'll lose that connection. Um, so we've always, um, in our RSPCA education packages, we've always encouraged respect for what, what we persist in calling mini beasts, that includes all the small invertebrates. We've always said, you know, encourage children to look at them, but not to touch them. Don't bring them into the classroom, apply the precautionary principle. So we do that wherever we can. Um, when it comes to wider policy, um, there are concerns about the um, proposed increased use of insects to feed humans and other animals. So this is being proposed as um, one of the solutions to the need to get enough protein into human beings and animals without causing yet more suffering to farm animals or destroying the planet. So there are a number of companies that are commercially farming insects for food. And this is raising some real issues with respect to insect welfare and slaughter. Um, so I think that will probably be the next step that, that we can really start getting to people, people to think about in a credible way. Um, but we're always going to run into difficulties because if you look at the, the scientific definition of an animal, you know, you'll come down to nematode worms who are composed of a few hundred cells. Mm. They are never going to have the sort of um, brain-like integrative structure that would generate um, subjective feelings. So maybe at some point there will be some kind of a cutoff, just as within the life of an individual sentient animal, they don't start off sentient, you know, when you're a, uh, a fertilized um, gamete you don't you're not sentient then you have this uh, it's normally thought of as like a sort of a dimmer switch process where at some point the animal becomes sentient within their lifetime but we don't know when that is either and I think this this is the problem when biological processes collide with legislation sooner or later it's going to get very difficult um, but to answer your question I think insects certainly would be the next group of animals to really start thinking about and I, I think that's going to cause us some really difficult philosophical questions. Mm. And I think we probably are going to have to think about, if not degrees of sentience, capacity to suffer and how much it matters to an insect to suffer versus how much to a mammal. And, and you know, I can't do the maths in my head, but is, is, is the amount of protein in one cow versus however many billions <laughs> of insects equivalent in terms of, you know, you've got millions of of individual animals suffering something is that is how does that equate to getting the protein from one it's pretty, animal pretty disturbing isn't it really yeah. pretty yes. troubling i think uh, it would be wonderful if we could say there was this threshold where if your brain is smaller than this you can't be sentient but there just isn't the evidence to back up that sort of claim at the moment our, our theoretical understanding of the brain mechanisms involved in generating subjective experience is not mature enough for us to really be able to confidently say you need at least this many neurons so we need to look at behavior and we need to have a serious discussion about insects it, it troubles me a lot really there's there's this classic picture of insects on which they they couldn't possibly feel pain because you cut the abdomen off and they don't even respond they just carry on feeding carry on mating but there's an emerging new picture on which that just isn't really true. And we can't write off insects that 
prematurely at all. And in fact, they do have you know, receptors that detect when things are getting too hot in particular, they seem very sensitive to heat. And they have flexible kinds of decision-making and learning to try and avoid you know, extreme heat and to, to get out of the way when they're forced to um, be exposed to it. So it's really quite worrying in this context Penny described where you've got all these new farming ventures springing up with no welfare oversight at all. So no codes of good practice, no regulation, no guidance on how to treat insects humanely. So if you want to just simply bake them alive, you're, you're allowed to. That is very concerning. And I think it should lead to a discussion and a debate about what sort of steps might be proportionate. Because you obviously can't just say, well, people tread on insects all the time, so let's ban walking. People kill insects with their cars, so let's ban driving. No one's gonna go down that route. you know. And I don't wanna be quoted out of context <laughs> on those things I, I just said and then disavowed. You know, I think um, we need to have a discussion about what would be proportionate. And I think codes of good practice for insect farming operations seems to me like a really sensible place to start. Uh, the great vegan debate is about whether you should eat honey or not for those vegans in the audience. Uh, as a vegan, this is a common point of discussion at parties. Do you and, and I happen to, I mean, I feel like I've came, come to the right person here, Jonathan. I believe you are one of the few, if not the, the only, uh, philosophers who has bees or your team has bees. Uh, have you learned anything? Can you help me with my question about the vegan debate? Uh, is this the sort of thing that I should be concerned about? I mean, this is really perhaps for everyone. Uh, there are uh, more prosaic bee, uh, bee industries. Uh, are they humane? Should I be concerned? I think there should also be codes of good practice. Yeah, I mean, I'm not suggesting banning any kind of farming, including insect farming, including uh, domestication of honeybees. And as, as you say, you know, part of my project team involves, uh, you know, is doing experiments with honeybees at Royal Holloway in, in Egham, where we have a very nice apiary. So I'm not saying ban all these things, of, of course not. Um, but let's have codes of good practice so that people are taking welfare seriously. I think there is a lot of that already in the bee world. I think beekeepers often do take seriously the welfare of their bees, but I don't think that same attitude is extended towards a lot of other insects. How can we improve the law associated with these sorts of things you know, for insects and maybe the broader scope of animals to which this sort of thing applies? Well, um... For insects, you could do anything because at the moment you don't really have any law. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we need to probably go back a step before that. We need some more science to get us to the level of evidence, perhaps the threshold that Jonathan found for his um, cephalopods and crustaceans. And then we can acknowledge their sentience and go from there. I think then we need more law where we're clear how to protect the welfare of these animals. So as Penny said, that the Sentience Act just says these animals are sentient, they can suffer. But for crustaceans and cephalopods, it doesn't tell us what we should and shouldn't do or can and can't do in terms of protecting their welfare. And a lot of that is actually because we don't really know. We don't know how to kill them humanely. We don't know how to farm them humanely or even if they could be farmed humanely. So we're a long way from where we are with mammals, where we think we know quite a lot about how to treat them humanely. And we have laws and codes of practice which tell us what we can and can't do to, to at least make sure that the most inhumane things aren't done to them, I guess. And so I think we're yeah. a very long way from, from that. Penny, do you have any thoughts about first steps? Yeah, the, well, I was just thinking, actually, there's been um, an interesting anomaly for some years now because scientific experiments on um, cephalopods have been regulated for some years. So already um, a researcher who needs to use a cephalopod has to apply to the home office for <clears throat> a project license and a personal license and there are limits on what they can do. Um, and the project has to undergo what's called a harm benefit analysis to look at justification. And the three R's that Jonathan mentioned, so you have to uh, replace the animal experiment wherever you can. If you can't, you have to optimize animal numbers so that the science is robust, reduce suffering and improve welfare. So that's already in place um, for scientists. 
So if a scientist went beyond their project license when they were doing research using a cephalopod, they can be prosecuted. But you or I could, could fish one out of a rock pool and essentially do whatever we liked. So it's quite um, ironic and it frustrated me, actually, notwithstanding the, the great job that Jonathan's team did, it frustrated me that the inquiry was going to look at cephalopods at all because I, I felt it was all there. You know, if their use in experiments is regulated, um, then that's that's clear that they're that they're sentient yeah. that's a presumption of, since you know, 1993 yeah. octopuses in science have been protected yeah so a, a long time and, and then all all cephalopods it was um it was uh, subsequently expanded to include all of them so from from my point of view i really think that animal experiments using decapod crustaceans should be um regulated without delay so that was what your report recommended wasn't it and uh there's a great organization called Crustacean Compassion that really champions the welfare of, uh, of crustaceans in all human animal contexts. And um, they're going to be writing to the Secretary of State to ask that the scope of the Animal Scientific Procedures Act, which regulates animal experiments in the UK, be expanded to include decapod crustaceans. Because at the Animal Scientific Procedures Act and the Animal Welfare Act both include clauses that state that the Secretary of State can expand the scope of these act when, acts when sufficient scientific evidence becomes available, which it is. Um, so I, I think that's really an essential next step for decapod crustaceans. And there's absolutely no justification for not re regulating experiments on them. So I hope that happens very soon. I think in principle, we have a pretty decent model for animal welfare law in the UK. I don't, don't know what you think, but we have this model that is based on oversight and accountability. So in science, for example, you have to get a project license. There's no fundamental limits that say you can't experiment on animals, but you've got to get a project license. You've got to make a case for the benefits outweighing the harms. And so there's this oversight and accountability. And there's a form of that in farming too, in that you've got the Animal Welfare Act that creates this duty of care. And then you've got codes of good practice that say what you have to do if you want to actually satisfy that duty of care. And so you, know, you can complain about the, the implementation of the model and, and a complaint scientists very often make is that it's so much more stringent on them than on anybody else. Mm. But in principle, that approach based on oversight and accountability is a good one. And, and so this Sentience Act is extending that further and that seems like a positive thing. But also to have that kind of oversight and accountability when it comes to experiments on crabs and lobsters and farming of these animals, I think would be a real positive step as well. Mm. Yeah, certainly. And obviously, the, the reason that the Animal Scientific Procedures Act is more rigorous is because it's an enabling act. So it's actually enabling researchers to um, treat animals in ways that, that um, would be eligible for prosecution under the Animal Welfare Act. Um, so that's why it's more stringent. But as Jonathan says, I think it's a, a really... Um, robust ethical decision making process you know the presumption is you don't do an animal experiment if there's an alternative and then um, all of the other requirements for minimizing impacts on animals ensuring justification um, I do a lot of work to champion the cause of um, local ethics committees or AWERBs which are a requirement at every research and testing establishment I'm particularly keen on lay representation so there's actually an opportunity for a member of the public to be around the table as well so Yes, there are some issues with implementation, um, but I actually think that's a good solid framework for decision making about processes that may harm animals that, um, yeah, yeah. Is, is... It's the sort of framework where, yes, it probably could be more robust in some ways, but by international standards, it's really pretty good. And if that sort of framework could be rolled out globally, we'd see huge benefits to animal welfare in, you know, in science around the world. Jonathan, were there recommendations in the report you wrote that, that weren't implemented that you imagine could or should be? Well, we had this very general high-level recommendation. We recommend re recognizing these animals as sentient. And then we had a lot more specific recommendations about the sort of things that might go into codes of good practice for how to treat them. So there's actually a lot of detail in the report about that that I won't go into, but we made recommendations, for example, regarding slaughter, and we recommended against what we consider extreme methods, like simply dropping a crab or lobster into a pan of boiling water without any effective prior stunning. There's a very strong case for, for banning that and requiring slaughter methods that are at least the most humane of those that currently exist. 
Absolutely. Um, and this, this is probably where I come in. I mean, we're really interested in trying to develop humane slaughter methods for these species because we accept that people are going to keep consuming them and killing them. And um, we don't necessarily have really well-tested slaughter methods for, for them the way we do for um, the animals that we more typically eat. Um, so however we might feel about it, we're going to need those methods. Um, and as we bring these animals under the protection of the law, we need to be able to offer a method that we can insist that people use um, once we've banned those methods, which I agree with Jonathan, are demonstrably inhumane. Yeah, I also think it's just unacceptable that you can order a live lobster to be delivered to you from Canada over the sea, you know, on you know, well-known online websites. Yes. And it's just um, no training at all is required by the person who then receives that animal at the other end. And it's just a basic principle for any vertebrate species that humane treatment requires training. If you're going to be humane, you have to be trained. And we need to be looking to implement that with. Are there options for the general public in the UK uh, to go to an expert and ensure that their lobster is has been humanely slaughtered? Well, I think we need to see more on the line of training programs. You know, if, if, you, if you're going to be taking the responsibility of killing an animal to eat it, then there's got to be some training requirements and some training provision you can go and do. But I mean, how am I going to kill my lobster is my short, my short question, you know? Um, Don't do it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, I would say you shouldn't. I, I, it's, if, you, if you have to eat them, you should probably leave it to the industry. And we should remember, I think we get quite hung up on this idea of either people killing their own lobster in their kitchen or, or having one fished out of a tank in a high-end restaurant. And the vast majority of these animals are killed on an industrial scale in Canada and elsewhere and processed in factories. And that's where we need to be making the change because that's where the animal welfare benefit will accrue. But also I would say that that's where we can probably get a humane method in place and then let, let those guys kill the animal for you. I know that may not be the best for your, <laughs> your preference in lobster if you eat them. My um, barbecue. I, yeah. yeah. And but, also, trans sorry, sorry, Hugh Johnson. No, go on. Transport is extremely stressful for animals. So if you've already gone and purchased a lobster, taken them to home or, or wherever, and then you're taking them on to somebody to kill them, you've hugely added to that animal's stress for no good reason. You, you don't have to eat lobster. So unless you can buy lobster that's been humanely killed, then eat something else. Uh, so another just, important yeah. idea here that is you know, good animal welfare regulation doesn't harm industry. It actually helps industry by creating minimum standards that everyone can feel happy about getting on board with and that they're not going to be undercut with. I mean, for example, there's this controversial practice of fishing a crab out of the sea, pulling its claw off and throwing it back in because all you want is the, is the claw. That's called declawing. And in, in the UK shellfish industry, this is already frowned upon. It's already controversial. Fishermen don't do it, but there's no law against it. And so there's always that possibility of having your welfare standards undercut by, by someone else. Animal welfare legislation helps people. It, it lets you know, consumers have confidence that a certain welfare standard has been met and it helps producers feel confident that they're not going to be undercut. And also, as I mentioned before, um, Obviously, it's very important to have a legal framework to protect these animals in all the different contexts of, of human animal use and interaction. But people don't have to wait for laws to change their behavior. Everybody could stop buying or consuming crab, lobster, um, cephalopods that have been inhumanely killed tomorrow. Everybody can control how their children interact with invertebrates tomorrow. So I think people can actually choose to do the right thing if, if they're properly informed and educated. And certainly that's the approach that we will be taking because it takes a long time for laws to change it's like it's like an ocean liner you know you, you it, it's steered and it takes a long time for mm. it to actually reach its its destination that's just the way that laws work um so i think that the the legal push has got to go in parallel with human behavior change too fantastic uh we have 15 minutes left for questions uh so there's a roving mic that can be brought around uh, so please raise your hand if you have a question, and uh, we'll take a few at a time. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, the woman in the back, please, first. In the... 
Uh, yes, please, if yes, possible. Yes, please, yeah, it's, uh, there it goes. Hi, I'm going to squeeze in two quick questions. Um, the first is about, um, you mentioned um, international standards. So how do we deal with this dilemma about cultural differences and the question of cultural sovereignty? You know, for instance, in some countries, it's okay for life slaughter or even eating an animal lively. So, so how do you handle that critique? And secondly, are you concerned there might be, um, as we call in my department, behavioral spillovers from uh, people thinking, well, it's humane, so I can eat more of it? Um, I'll have a, uh, a brief go at the, the cultural differences question. Uh, I mean, we should point out that the Sentience Act has a specific clause, even in this country, which goes on to permit um, non-stunned slaughter for religious reasons or to allow ministers to make an exception in that case, which we've always made. So my personal position and the position of my organization is that all animals should be stunned before slaughter, for instance. But I, I think the reality is going to be in terms of this debate that government is not going to be willing to act on that particular issue. So there is always going to be a real reluctance from governments and lawmakers to challenge um, cultural or religious um, uh, ingrained approaches to, to certain animal welfare issues as much as we'd like them to. Yeah, that, that is an issue. That's the problem. Simply being recognised as sentient does not mean you're going to be humanely treated. I mean, it's very widely recognised that human beings are, are sentient and I don't need to highlight what's going on in the world right now. So it's certainly not any kind of a safeguard in the, these um, issues will persist. But there's an organisation, there's an international animal health organisation called OIE, which is a, an acronym for something French, which I can't pronounce, um, but they produce international guidelines. They're, they're quite basic, so they, they produce them on various um, veterinary animal health issues. They have produced one on animal experimentation as well. Um, the requirements are quite baseline and it's voluntary for countries to sign up to them, but it is something and it, it does permit some kind of harmonization. Um, and it's it can it, it's um global it's not a european thing so uh countries all around the world can sign up to these codes of practice and quite a few do i, I would say as well now penny's mentioned globalization i think actually in some cases that's had a positive effect so we've seen big changes in china for instance in animal welfare in a positive direction i mean they have a, a piece of legislation that covers their animals used in research, which looks an awful lot like the British legislation. And it's not by accident, it's because there's a push to globalization in biomedical research, which means they need to have standards that, that work around the world. And we're, we're seeing that with, with food in China too, because there are global players, big European supermarkets operate in China, produce food in China um, to, to EU standards essentially. And probably actually the EU has been one of the enormous drivers for global animal welfare because so many countries even outside the EU effectively produce to their standards. So globalization might not always be good, but in this case, maybe it's had quite a positive effect. Yeah, and I'm sure the, you know, the government in China doesn't want China to become the sort of an ethics dump, so to speak, where you know people who want to do controversial research outsource it. Now, they don't want that, which means there has to be some degree of alignment with sort of international scientific standards. So in science, yeah, that's one case where there's a really strong case for international standards. And then I suppose the question was also probably thinking about farming and you know, cultural diversity in farming methods. I think one of the nice things about the, the model we have in the UK is that it really seems to minimize unnecessary conflict because it is fundamentally not about you know, politicians trying to score points by just banning this or that thing and saying, ban that, let's ban that. It's rather about having a framework based on accountability and oversight, where there's then codes of good practice that are designed properly by experts who, who know what they're doing. And that seems like a framework that anyone can get on board with uh, in, in any country across the world, because there may be sort of local best practices. You know, there's, there's a multitude of ways to treat animals humanely that are applicable in different contexts, but all of that can go into a well-designed code of good practice and it, and it takes some of the politics out of it and makes it genuinely about getting standards people can agree to. 
I think it does to an extent, but I, I've been involved in drawing up codes of practice for housing, husbandry and care of laboratory animals. And you get attention, so uh, um, a tension, not attention. So I've been tasked with drawing up codes of practice that meet animals' needs. And you look at what evidence there is and, and you come up with a code of practice that meets animals' needs. But then industry say this will be far too expensive. And so it, you do end up watering down what you're what you're trying to do. But it's certainly it's an opportunity to have some input and to get people thinking. And it's certainly better than nothing. Uh, there was a question here. Uh, the Yes, right there. Uh, and the others, if you could just raise your hands once more while he's asking the question, I'll note you down for the next. Go ahead, sir. Um, thanks. I was just wondering, so we focused on, on organisms with um, a brain, right? And I was just thinking to what extent the sentiency debate extends to um, organisms without a brain. So maybe clams, oysters, that kind of stuff. Because say when you squeeze lemon on an oyster, you see it, it, it reacts. And is that just me projecting my own emotions on the oyster? Or is, it, is, is that just a reflex or is there a level of sentiency? Thanks. I think it's very natural to worry about uh, other mollusks. I mean, octopuses are mollusks. The cephalopod mollusks are, are mollusks. It's natural to start worrying about uh, snails and about bivalves. And there's a real lack of evidence. I mean, the evidence is just incredibly thin. So we don't have the sort of strong evidence-based case we can make for octopuses in those cases. But in our own lives, I mean, we, we all have to decide what is proportionate for us, I think. And you might well feel as though you want to err on the side of caution in some of these cases. I think, I mean, what's for sure is, you know, we're talking about animals with nervous systems, with ganglia that researchers are increasingly willing to call brains. So, so nematode worms, for example, researchers working on nematodes will often talk about the brain. And they, they didn't used to do that, but now they've realized the extraordinary complexity of the, the main nerve ring, they're increasingly just calling it a tiny brain. And, um, and bivalves, although there's far, far less research than on nematode worms, may be in a similar category. We may easily underestimate them. So if you've got this situation where you're worried about underestimating the animal, you don't have a lot of evidence to go on. We're not in that situation where there's a real, really clear case for legislating, like we are with octopuses. But still, in our own personal lives, we might want to think about what sort of precautions we might want to take, I think. The next question's uh, right behind him. I want to be slightly provocative. I really enjoy the discussion around um, uh, insects, but even that was discussed in the context of industrial farming. Um, and I wondered, is there a case for worrying about welfare uh, when with wild animals, when humans aren't the source of a suffering of a pain? Thank you. Yeah, there, there absolutely is. And that's why um, I was delighted to see free living wild animals being included in the Animal Sentience Act, um, because under the Animal Welfare Act, the one you can be prosecuted under, you can only be prosecuted for cruelty to a wild animal if they're under human control. So, for example, anybody could just sort of take a, a pot shot at a wild animal with a, with a gun and wound them and not be responsible for making sure um, that they're humanely killed. Um, so humans cause wild animals huge amounts of stress. Um, humans, dogs and cats cause wild animals huge amounts of, of stress and suffering. Um, and I think when the Animal Sentience Act comes into play and the Animal Sentience Committee is enabled to look at government policy, I really want to see the impact on, on the welfare of free living wild animals come to the fore and be given a very um, long overdue priority that it deserves. I think we we also worrying about the the welfare of animals where there, where there's no effect from humans. In other words, animals inflicting suffering on other animals. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, clearly, suffering in general to me is a bad thing. So I, I would like to see less of it. I mean, on a very pragmatic point as an animal welfare charity, we choose to focus on the things where we can make a difference. So I tend to think it's extremely hard to think how I'm going to prevent that kind of suffering and it's very easy to think how I might bring about some change in farming systems or the use of animals in research um, and intervening in, in sort of nature that's genuinely not affected by humans and it's very hard to work out when it's not affected especially now that we've managed to screw up the entire climate um, but nonetheless intervening there seems 
conceptually very difficult for me to yeah. think how I would do it. So I, I'm sort of choosing to ignore it, I guess. I think um, I think the, the, the problem is if you sort of intervene um, with respect to the welfare of wild animals, and I'm just reflecting, I'd probably do this by feeding the birds in my, in my garden. Um, it can be argued that you're disrupting natural selection. And so if you're artificially favoring individuals who would otherwise have died and enabling them to have offspring who are also not fitted to that environment, you could argue that you're actually causing more suffering than if you just let well alone. Um, I guess the difference for me is if I'm out and I see a wild animal who's critically injured and obviously going to suffer for a long time or die, then I feel motivated to do something because I, I, then I feel that I won't have uh, upset the balance or interfered with, um, with natural selection. But yeah, that there are people who, who feel very strongly that, that humans ought to intervene more actively in wild animal welfare. And that, that's extremely controversial. Yeah, there's no, no easy answers to that one. I'm glad people are thinking about it and talking about it. I mean, I agree with what's been said. Well, maybe not all because I'm not bothered about interfering with natural selection. I think we, we do that all the time through our actions anyway. But I think this point about it is so, so difficult to be confident that your intervention is doing more good than harm yeah. when you're intervening in a wild population. I think that's a really serious point. You can think about cases like the the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone is sometimes debated as a point of conflict between conservation and, and welfare, where apparently it was really terrible for the, uh, the deer that they, you know, in, instead of being able to go wherever they want, they now have to cower in, in woods and having a terrible time, but really good for the beavers because the moving away of deer from the river's edge allowed trees to grow and the beavers are now having a fantastic time. So I think even in those very well studied cases, it's unbelievably difficult conceptually and scientifically to work out whether an intervention has benefited welfare or detracted from it. You know, let's discuss it, but let's take the problem seriously. Uh, the next question is here in the flower dress. Thanks. Um, back to the point of uh, the experiments that validated the sentience of octopuses. You talked a lot about the uh, experiments that highlighted the learning and avoidance of pain. Yeah. I'm curious to know if the findings also highlighted any other sort of complex emotions or reactions such as uh, joy or kinship or love. Feldschmerz, just the full spectrum. There's a lot we don't know about octopuses. I wouldn't want to underestimate them in any of these respects. We were focused in our report on evidence that was more rele relevant to the negative side of mental life, like pain, stress. There's other evidence, though, that is more about the positive side. What particularly comes to mind are these cases of octopuses playing, or at least the researchers are often inclined to call it play, where they're in the tank. And this is Jennifer Mather um, in Canada, who puts a little empty pill bottle in the tank, and they use the jet of water they can put out to play with it. So they, they blow it towards the, the water intake and then it drifts back to them and then they blow it back out again and it drifts back and they blow it back out. And it just seems, you know, for all the world as though this octopus is just trying to sort of have fun. It's trying to play with this pill bottle. So now that's not conclusive, it's just suggestive, but I suspect there's a lot of interesting stuff going on on the positive side of octopus mental life as well. But there are a lot of um anecdotes around so for example I was visiting the Plym Plymouth Marine Lab once and they told me about a cuttlefish who would jet and squirt people one person in particular that they yeah. seem to yeah not like that there's <laughs> you speak they, they to, take against individuals they do yes yeah. if, if you speak to people who work in, a, in Aquaria they will tell you a lot of these stories yeah I think there's something going on yeah it's fascinating because they're largely solitary animals hmm. so they're doing all this sophisticated stuff despite being solitary and we often think that intelligence and sentience might be things that go with being social, but the octopus seems to challenge that. It's also very short lived, which is another oh, strange yeah. feature of an animal that seems to be so um, cogn cognitively sophisticated and yeah. highly sentient. One of my favorite anecdotes was about a scientist who saw the, the octopus in an aquarium uh, who didn't like its, its lunch. It was sort of stale or old. Uh, wait until the scientist arrived in the aquarium and then grab the lunch, look the scientist right in the eye and then stuff it down the drain <laughs> as, if it, 
out of spite, I suppose. It's like quite complex. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for today. So thank you everyone so much. And thank you, especially to the panelists.